Hello and welcome to the 741 channel. Thank you for stopping by. Today I've got some cool old ham radio gear to show you guys. In particular the main showpiece here is the Drake TR7. But there's a bunch of accessories here with it of course. So first up I'll tell you guys how I came to be this radio's current steward. And then after that we'll take a closer look at all this stuff and see what it is, see what it does, see what kind of features it has. And then we'll fire it all up and see how it works. So the story of the Drake TR7 actually starts over here with my Drake 4 line. Now back in the winter of 2003, I decided it was finally time to upgrade from technician class, which I had gotten in 92, to general. Now I had some time on my hands, so I went down to the ARRL and I bought the study manual for the general license. And I came home and started reading up on that. Back then you needed to pass a five word a minute code test as well. So I got some computer programs to download to help me learn Morse code. And I was able to do that in conjunction with the ARRL bulletins. So I think by March or April I was ready to take the test. And I actually took the test at the ARRL headquarters. The test was sponsored by a local club in Newington, Connecticut. They just happened to use uh, one of the boardrooms there at the ARRL to hold the test was able to pass the written part with flying colors. The code test, I was able to pass it. I struggled a little bit, but uh, managed to get through that and got my general license. And then I got home and realized I didn't have an HF radio, <laughs> nor did I have a lot of money at that time to go buy one. So a couple of months went by. I remember it was the 4th of July and I went to a yard sale and I came across a whole pile of amateur radio equipment at this guy's yard sale. I think he was a ham and he was getting ready to move. So this guy must have been hoarding equipment in his barn because he had this whole table full of amateur radio equipment. And right in the middle of the table was a bunch of Drake radios. So I started kind of looking at it and the guy noticed that I was checking it out. He probably figured I knew kind of what I was looking at. So he came over, we started talking. I told him the story of how I had just upgraded and needed a radio. So he made me a real good deal on this whole pile of Drake equipment. I ended up giving him 75 bucks, which was all the money I had in my wallet at that point. And he gave me these four radios, a whole box of parts and tubes and that kind of thing. And I actually had a Heath kit, HW101, that came with it too. Now the Heath kit didn't work. I kept it for a couple of years, but decided I wasn't going to do anything with it. Ended up selling it. One of the really only radios that I've ever sold, to be honest. But ended up keeping the Drake stuff. The two up top here, the receiver and the transmitter, the twins, they worked okay. As soon as I was able to get home, I put up a 80 meter dipole and I was able to get on 80 meters. I was tickled pink. I didn't actually make a lot of contacts though. I was a little bit nervous, but at least I had the capability. The radios worked pretty good, but of course they drifted a little bit, but that was to be expected for this old equipment. And I was happy using them. So the whole point of that backstory is to just say that because the Drakes were my first kind of HF radios, I've always had kind of a soft spot in my heart for the old drakes and every time i go to a ham fest i'm always looking for drake equipment but as you can imagine the stuff is always priced just a little bit higher than it should be and i'm just never able to kind of make a deal but that all changed a couple of weeks ago when i got an email from don w1fyg now some of you probably know don from the youtubers bunch he's been in on a few of the live streams the trivia night and he's always in the chat. He's part of the Don Army. So Don happens to be president of the Shoreline Amateur Radio Club here in Connecticut. And he ended up inheriting this Drake stuff from a Silent Key that was a member of his club. The Silent Key in question is George Smith, KD1FN. Now Don told me that George was really an active member of the club and enjoyed it immensely. Now Don told me that he didn't really have a lot of time to get on the air that often, but when he did, he really enjoyed using this old Drake, putting it on the air and making contacts. But like I said, recently George passed away and his widow didn't quite know what to do with all this stuff. So she called Don and Don took it away and promised her that he would take good care of it. Now I guess Don didn't really have a use for this equipment. So he decided that what he wanted to do was pass it on to somebody that would use it and take good care of it. He saw some of my videos and realized I had those old Drakes back there and figured that maybe I would be somebody that would be willing to kind of take this radio on. We exchanged emails about it and I told him that I was very interested in this old Drake because I have that sweet spot in my heart for these old radios. And he offered to 
give it to me, donate it to the channel, so to speak, on the condition that I don't turn around and try and sell it for a profit, which I wouldn't do. Like I said, I've always wanted one of these old Drakes and I'm not one to kind of turn around and sell radios anyway. Once something comes into this shack, it generally grows roots and doesn't leave. But the problem was, was that I felt that this was just too big of a donation for the channel, so to speak. So I kind of argued with Don and I told him that I'd love to take the radio, but that I insisted that I wanted to pay him for it in fair value, not just a few bucks. So we kind of talked back and forth and we hashed it out a little bit. Don was stubborn and said that he wasn't going to accept any money for it. So what I decided to do instead was donate some money to ham radio related charities on Don's behalf in exchange for the Drakes. So that's what we ended up doing. We decided on a couple of charities and I sent that money to them and then took the radios from Don. And like I said, I promised Don that I wouldn't turn around and try and sell these things. Uh, even if I bought these things outright, even if they were brand new radios, like I said, stuff tends to grow roots here. So once I acquire something, I generally don't get rid of it. So I pretty much consider myself just the current steward of this stuff. I'm just gonna look after it for a while and kind of keep it in good condition. If for some reason that changes and I'm not able to keep it here anymore or not able to maintain it or whatever, so my plan would be to just pass it on to somebody else who would be able to take care of it and be a good steward of this equipment and keep it in the hobby in good working condition for as long as we can. All right, so first up, let's take an overview of what's here and then we'll take a closer look at each piece. First up is the star of the show. This is the Drake TR7. Over here is the companion power supply for the TR7, the PS7. So over here up on top, you've probably already noticed that these two gray boxes are not Drake equipment. These are actually Kenwood pieces. This is an AT200 and this is an SP520. These would have been companion pieces for a Kenwood TS520 or radios in that era. But this is what George originally had and used with his Drake. So what ended up happening is I told a friend of mine locally that I had got this stuff from Don, and he told me he happened to have a Drake MN7, or matching network, that he was wanting to sell. <laughs> so I ended up buying this from my friend locally, and I'll use it with the Drake stuff. And I'll probably use this Kenwood stuff with the Kenwood TS520 that I have. So the last piece that came with the Drake from Don and was originally used by George was the Kenwood MC50 microphone. Now, another coincidence here is that when I bought that Kenwood TS520 I was just mentioning, it came with a Drake handheld microphone. So what I might do is use the Drake microphone I got with my Kenwood on the Drake and then use the Kenwood mic <laughs> over on the Kenwood instead. I guess we'll see what happens. This is a pretty nice mic and I can easily move it back and forth between each radio. But I just thought it was kind of a neat coincidence that I bought a Kenwood and got a Drake mic and then ended up getting a Drake <laughs> with a Kenwood mic. Anyway, let's get in and take a closer look at all this stuff. So the first item we'll look at is the PS7 power supply. Now, as you can probably tell, this thing is built like a tank. According to the manual, the unit weighs 32 pounds and is capable of putting out 25 amps. I'm not sure if you guys can see through the perforation here in the top grill, but this whole front part of the power supply is pretty much just the transformer. Then back here there's some filter caps and then sort of a circuit board. And then on the sides here, you can see there's a pretty beefy heat sink and some pass transistors here on both sides. So when Drake built this thing, they were serious about it, and they built this thing the last. So here's a look at the TR7. Now for its day, this radio was pretty cutting edge. It was one of the very first ham radio transceivers that was all solid state. Up till that point, the transmitter final stages used tubes for the most part, but this one is all transistors. Another thing that was kind of new back in the late 70s when this radio came out, is the digital display. You didn't see too many of those back then. Now there's a bunch of other features here. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Now in particular, the passband tuning is something that works pretty well on this radio. If you're tuning around and there's some interference, you can use this to kind of shift the receive window a little bit one way or the other to kind of filter that out. This radio also had selectable filters. I think there's up to four that you can choose from. 
It's got a built-in SWR meter, it's got built-in Vox capability, and it's got provisions for crystals. If you found yourself operating a single frequency, you could put a crystal in and use it that way. It was a little more stable. Now, the only thing I really don't like about this radio is the band control knob itself. I mean, it works just fine, but just kind of the way it's all displayed here, just it feels like an old CB radio from the time to me. I feel like they could have done something a little more like this with the band control and put the indicator sort of behind the bezel and had it kind of like that, but maybe they ran out of time to develop that and just did what they could to get this thing to market. I'm not really sure. Anyway, we're going to take a closer look at all these features when I dig in and start using the radio. But for now, I'll do a quick overview of the rest of the stuff over here before we come back and really dig into the radio. So next up, you can see we have a Kenwood SP520 and a Kenwood AT200 tuner. Now, these two pieces are what came with the Drake. These are what George Smith would have used with it when he owned the radio. Now, I don't know for sure if he bought the radio new or he got it used, but I'm guessing that he used these because it was hard for him to find an actual Drake tuner and speaker, or maybe he was able to find them and they just cost too much. So there's not a whole lot to say about the speaker other than it's in pretty decent shape for its age. And of course, it really is a companion speaker for a Kenwood TS520, but it works fine with the Drake. And then over here is the Kenwood AT200 tuner. So as for the tuner, it's pretty much got your standard controls that you would expect. It's not a modern style cross needle type you have to kind of flip the switches to read the SWR, but that's no big deal. So the tuning controls are nice and big so that you can really dial in and fine tune that antenna if you need to. Build quality is pretty good, just like you'd expect from a piece of Kenwood equipment. But other than that, again, there's really not a whole lot to say about this tuner other than that George kept it in excellent shape. There really aren't too many cosmetic blemishes to it, and it does seem to work fairly well. So next up is the Drake MN7 matching network or tuner. Now, like I said earlier in the video, I got this from a friend of mine after I got the Drake stuff from Don. He found out that I got the Drake stuff and offered to sell this to me so that I would have the matching piece. So it's got a lot of the sort of same features and controls that the Kenwood tuner does. It just works a little bit differently. And of course the knobs are even bigger on this one. So you can really get in there and make those fine adjustments if you need to. And of course the meter is much bigger and easier to read than the Kenwood unit. But other than that, there's really not a whole lot to say about this other than it's nice to have the matching tuner for the Drake. Okay, so we'll just take a quick look at the back of all this stuff. Now, normally you wouldn't connect this ground braid between all these pieces of equipment like I have here. When I get this thing set up in its permanent location over on my station bench, this will be set up properly in a star configuration. For right now, I've just got it set up like this so that I've got something connecting the radios. But you can see we've got the typical connections for antennas and whatnot over here on the tuners. And then looking at the back of the radio, you can see over here there's a pretty beefy cooling fan. Now when the radio is running, this fan is always going. And it's kind of loud. I'm not sure if this is the original fan that would have been with the radio, but it is kind of noisy. So I may look into replacing it with something a little newer and maybe a little quieter. If I don't end up replacing it, I'm going to at least fix this wiring. You can kind of see that it's a 110 volt fan that plugs into a jack on the back of the radio, but the previous owner just kind of pigtailed it in here. Now the wiring is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just kind of loose and dangly back here. And I want to clean that up a little bit. Down here are the two connections to the PS7 power supply. This one over here is the main power connection for the 13.8 volts. And this one is sort of the control cable. And then over here you can see there's two more cinch receptacles for other accessories and things that you can use with the radio, presumably amplifiers and VFOs and that kind of a thing. And then there's a few more jacks here for external receive antennas and audio output, things like that. And then up here there's a few trimmer adjustments that you can make. I'm not sure what these are for just yet. I gotta pull the manual and study it to really find out what those do. So those of you who are Drake aficionados will probably already have noticed that the back panel is sort of split into thirds, which indicates it's sort of a later model or second gen TR7. And of course you may have noticed the serial number down there also, which is 4919, which I think is maybe a few hundred above the cutoff date when Drake switched over to sort of the second gen model. And then here's a look at the back of the power supply. You can see there's provisions for auxiliary DC power out 
ALC connection and a Vox relay. In addition to the ground braid, which like I said before, isn't connected properly at the moment. And then over here you can see there's a cooling fan similar to what's on the radio. It's also a 110 volt fan that plugs in, but this one's much quieter than the one on the radio. Okay, so that's sort of the high level overview of all the equipment that I got from Don and well that tuner that I got from my friend as well. So let's dive in and actually use the radio now. So the first thing I'll do is tune around the bands a little bit, let you guys listen to some received signals. We'll play with some of the controls so you can kind of see how they work. And then towards the end of the video, I'll do sort of a transmit test. I'll hook up to a dummy load and then we'll put the SDR play on and you guys can listen to what the radio sounds like. And then we'll probably wrap things up from there. Okay, so let's tune around, see what we can hear, and play around with some of the receive features on this radio. You may have already noticed that the noise from the cooling fan is a bit loud. Hopefully it's not coming through the camera too much. I'll make sure to get the volume up nice and high so it drowns it out. The second thing I'll mention is that right now, the volume is actually all the way down, but there's still sound coming out of the speaker, and actually a fair amount of it. So I'm not sure if that indicates that there's something wrong here with the radio or the volume control, or if that's just how these radios were. Either way, I'll look into it and see if I can figure it out. One other thing I'll mention is that the antenna that I'm using right now is my 40 and 80 meter fan dipole. That's up in the trees in my backyard about, I don't know, 12 or 15 feet off the ground. Here will be better, no doubt. They're rolling everything out. But uh, Andy, welcome back from Michigan. Andy's a road warrior, and he uh, logs quite a bit of time in the mobile. Your S9 from the home base this morning, Andy. I rotated the antenna, and yeah, a little scotch over S9. Usual signal, great um, audio, and no trouble copying you at all. All right, we're going to move on. Seven three to you and yours. K A three Y J U W A three D Z S. Good morning, Charlie. Okay, so as you heard, the signals are all pretty strong this morning, at least on this net. What I'll do now is play around with the filtering a bit so you guys can hear that. So in the Drake TR7 you can install up to four filters. This one only has two installed, the sideband filter and what I think is the AM filter. So we've been listening in the wider AM filter. So what I'll do now is turn the volume up and then switch over to the sideband filter so that you guys can hear the difference. Although I'm not sure how well it'll translate through the camera microphone, but we'll try it anyway. Solid S910 over. Okay, so here's the AM filter. Is two, one, zero, and now I've switched over to the sideband filter. Uh, Roger that, Bob. KD2 OHI WA3DZS. Nice to catch up with you again. Let's see. Let me uh, get in the log here. Uh, I'm a terrible left handed typist, as I always say, but I got the bike in the right hand. <laughs> All right, uh, Bob is in Fairport, New York. Bob, you're about, to, uh, I turned the antenna. I was uh, uh, towards the west to pick up Andy out there. Okay, so right now with those signals being real strong, I would tend to want to run this in the AM mode so that I get nice fidelity out of that audio. But if I was tuning around in noisy conditions and I wanted to kind of narrow up that passband a bit, the sideband filter would do a good job of that. In fact, what I'll do now is tune around and see if I can find a weaker signal and we'll try it on that. So I found a weaker station on this frequency and there's a little bit of noise in the background. I'll play with the filter here so you guys can hear the difference. Right now we're in the wider AM filter and you can kind of hear that adjacent station sort of off to the edge there. If I go to the sideband filter, it cuts that noise out a bit. So another feature this receive has is passband tuning. And that works well when you've got two stations sort of close together like I have right here. I'll turn the volume up so you can hear that. Okay, so you can hear that adjacent signal. I can cut that out a little bit by playing with the filter, but it's still there and kind of interfering. So one thing I can try to do to kind of cut that down more is to use the passband tuning option. So if I enable that, you can see this light turns on. Now I can move this control. Okay there, Mike. Your drink is uh, doing just fine at 15 watts there. Uh, definitely got some QSP, but you've been bouncing anywhere up on this between an S2 and an S5. Thank you so much for your check-in this morning. I know you will do it whenever you can. So you can hear that adjacent signal real close to the one I was trying to listen to. 
and I just moved the pass band control up a little bit and I was able to shift that receive window over so that I could hear just the signal I wanted and that other unwanted adjacent signal was kind of nulled out. So another feature that this receiver has is an RIT, or Receive Incremental Tuning. And what that does is it allows you to kind of vary the receive frequency a little bit while leaving the transmit frequency alone. And that can be useful if you're talking to somebody who's using an older radio that maybe drifts around a little bit, or maybe they're slightly off frequency. So if I push the button in and turn it on, you can see this light lights up to let me know it's on. And now I can tune this control and you can see it varies the frequency of the display. And like I said before, it only changes the receiver's frequency. It doesn't change the transmit frequency. So let's take a look at one more thing with the passband tuning. You can see that I'm down in the CW portion of the band now. And if I turn the volume up, you can hear I've got some CW going on there. Now this radio doesn't have the CW filter built in, it's just got the sideband filter which, as you may be able to tell, is pulling in a few different CW stations all at the same time. So it's a little bit hard to figure out which one you want to copy, especially when the signals are all kind of down in the noise a little bit. So one thing you can do to get around that is to use the passband tuning, I've got that enabled here, and then I can just kind of slide this control up and it'll help move that receive window over a little bit so that I can hear just the only signal that I want to hear. Now it's not a perfect solution because you still can kind of hear some stuff kind of faintly on the edges there, but it's better than nothing if you don't have that CW filter, which could be hard to find for an old radio like this. Another thing I can sort of do to help in the absence of the CW filter is use the RIT control to kind of fine tune things a little bit and just get that signal where I want it so that I can copy it. So I'll flip over to 20 meters or maybe 15. We'll tune around a little bit, see what we can hear over there. And then I'll try a transmit test. Yeah, well, really nice to speak with you, uh, John. I'm glad to uh, make it over to very chilly uh, uh, Dakota <laughs> this afternoon. The time, what's the time over here is 20 past, uh, 20 past three. Uh, what, what, what's the time over there, Don? Over? Whiskey Tango Zero Sierra, number two Whiskey Zero Charlie Yankee Echo returning. Yeah, well, okay, uh, Don. Well, it's been uh, my pleasure to uh, to speak with uh, with you. Uh, always nice to, to meet a, a very um, polite individual on the air. I think it goes a, a long way, Don. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of a transmit test on the Drake. I've switched it over and put it on a dummy load. So what I've got set up behind me is my SDR Play RSP DX. Just hooked up to a piece of wire laying across the radio bench there. And I've got SDR Uno running over here. That should be good enough to be able to hear the Drake on the dummy load. And we'll be able to see kind of what it looks like in the spectrum scope there. And be able to hear the transmit audio from the Drake. So let's do that now. Okay, so here's a test of the Drake transmit audio on 40 meters, lower sideband, using the Kenwood MC50 microphone. One, two, three, four, five. Five, four, three, two, one. November one, November uniform golf. Okay, so now let's test the Drake using the Drake handheld microphone that I already had. One, two, three, four, five. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so I've switched over to AM mode using the Kenwood MC50 microphone. One, two, three, four, five. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so here's what the Drake sounds like on AM with the Drake handheld microphone. One, two, three, four, five. Five, four, three, two, one. November one, November uniform golf. Okay, so 
here's a test of the Drake on 20 meters upper sideband using the Kenwood MC50 microphone. One, two, three, four, five. Five, four, three, two, one. November one, November uniform go. Okay, so here's a test of the Drake handheld microphone on 20 meter upper sideband. One, two, three, four, five. Five, four, three, two, one. November 1, November Uniform Golf. Okay, let's test out AM mode on 20 meters using the Kenwood MC50 microphone. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. November 1, November Uniform Golf. Okay, so here's the Drake handheld microphone on AM. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. November one, November uniform golf. So as you heard in the previous clips, there's some good and there's some bad. It actually sounds pretty good on sideband. Uh, on the 40 meter test, I think I had the mic gain turned up a little bit too high. But on 20 meters, it didn't sound bad on sideband. But you guys probably noticed on AM, for whatever reason, the audio is kind of low, and it's also missing one of the sidebands for some reason. Not sure why that would be, but looks like I got a little bit of a project on my hands. Now I know a little bit about radios and how to fix certain things, but this is going to be a bit of a stretch for me. I'm going to probably end up learning a thing or two trying to fix this AM problem with this. Now luckily, I don't use AM that much, so it's not a high priority thing, but I do want to dig in and see if I can figure out what's going on. So what I'll do now is fire up my ICOM 746 Pro, and we'll do the same tests that we did with the Drake. That way you can kind of make a comparison between the old radio and, well, I guess another old radio, but one that's newer and I know is sort of working properly. Here's a test of my ICOM 746 Pro using my Heil PR781 microphone in medium EQ mode. One, two, three, four, five. Five, four, three, two, one. November 1, November Uniform Golf. Here's a test of the ICOM 746 Pro running the Heil PR781 microphone in AM mode. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. November 1, November Uniform Golf. So there's what the ICOM sounded like. Now, arguably, I've got a much better microphone on the ICOM, and it's a newer radio. It's got sort of built in EQs. There's a wide, medium, and narrow setting. I had it on the medium setting for this test. And then you probably noticed when I switched over to AM, both sidebands were present and the audio level was much higher. Not as good quality as an old Collins rig or something like that, but <laughs> better than what the Drake's doing right now, unfortunately. So I think that's gonna wrap things up for the Drake for today. As you saw in the video, it's a pretty solid radio cosmetically and functionally. Now, of course, I'm gonna have to take care of that problem with the AM mode to really get it back to 100%, but stuff like that is to be expected. But that's one of the things I like about these old radios. It gives me a reason to dig in and learn a little bit about how they work and try and understand the, the circuit and the theory behind it and hopefully fix it. Now, along with taking care of that AM problem, I'm gonna to wanna to try and do a bit of an alignment on this thing. As you saw in the video, it's working pretty good, but probably could use at least a touch-up alignment in the receiver. After all, it is 40 years old and probably hasn't been touched since it was new. If I get real ambitious, maybe I'll even go through and replace all the electrolytic capacitors and kind of things like that that deteriorate over time. I guess I'll make that decision later on once I get the cover off and see what things look like inside. When I start digging into this radio, I'll be sure to turn the camera on so you guys can follow along and see what I'm doing and maybe even offer some suggestions, help, and advice as I go through this thing. <laughs> like I said a few times in this video, I'm no expert when it comes to this stuff and part of the process here is for me to learn a little bit as I go. Maybe you guys can help with that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Not so much for me, but for George Smith, KD1FN, the original owner of the radio, and for Don, W1FYG, for passing it on to me. If you'd like to leave a comment or subscribe, feel free to do that as well. If you'd like to support my channel in another way, please consider visiting my Amazon store. 
which is linked in the description below. Thanks for watching. But you can see that we've got the basic antenna inputs and outputs over here on the tuners, speaker wires, we got a cat coming through. Okay, so here's a test of the Drake handheld mic. mic ugh. Audio's kind of low. Carrier's high. Carrier. Carrier. Handheld microphone on AM using. Why does that sound like it's off? I don't know. Put you over there or not. Okay. Stay. What do you think, Maple? Does it pass inspection?